All right, buddy. So why don't you kick us off uh, and let us know what Strive 305 is. Uh, our sponsor uh, is the Office of the Mayor of uh, Miami-Dade County, and Danilo is his is uh, Daniela Levine Cava's uh, lead uh, in the effort called Strive 305. Uh, thank you for supporting us, and, 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 and thank you for coming uh, on your birthday. Well, thank you, Dan. Like I said, I wouldn't miss it. This is something that I'm passionate about, helping small business owners. And uh, just to start from the very beginning, my name is Danilo Vargas. I am the Small Business Innovation Manager in the office of Miami-Dade Mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. And I used to work with her at Accelerate South Day. You know, she founded that incubator in Cutler Bay. It's still running. It's still run by Nana. And uh, it's a great resource if you want to check it out. She started that four years ago. And she tasked me now that she is the mayor with taking some of those initiatives countywide. And she announced her Strive 305 initiative, which we are so blessed and grateful to be partnering with BizHack to make this amazing training possible. Now, Strive 305 focuses on five key challenges that small business owners face, right? We want to tackle these because the mayor has been clear. She wants to make it easier than ever in Miami-Dade County to own and grow your small business. So we are here. You're not alone. I'm here to help you. The BizHack team is here to help you. That's why we're super excited about this. And the five things we want to tackle is access to funding, which we know is very critical. We saw that during COVID. Access to resources. Many people uh, came to me and said, I don't know where to go for help, uh, Danilo. I don't know who can help me. We need to bridge that gap. And we are creating a portal called Strive 305 in the miamidade.gov website that will connect all the pieces. You go there and you'll be, at, be able to access all the resources in Miami-Dade County from our partners, the county itself, et cetera. And of course, training, skills, like the one we're gonna learn today, how to make your brand pop on Instagram, how to you know rise to the top when there's so much competition, that's key, knowing how to win this game of small business. And then oh, of course, last two things are workspaces. We know that Miami-Dade County is very expensive when it comes to workspace. So how do you set up an office? How do you set up retail space? We wanna tackle that and make it affordable for more business owners to participate in that. And lastly, it can be lonely to be an entrepreneur. I've been there, I had a small business, and I know that sometimes it can feel like you against the world, but it's not like that. You have great people like the team at BizHack and what you're gonna to learn today, the mayor, the, the whole county, we are behind you and we need to build that sense of community and we're gonna do it through events like this, but maybe live next year, right? So that we can have that camaraderie and that sense of being in this together. So that being said, I am really happy to be with you guys. It is my birthday. And I would not miss this for the world because I'm really looking forward to learning from the team at BizHack, Dan, Tatiana, and Lilia, amazing world-class knowledge um, educators. That's what they are. So I'm really excited. Wouldn't miss it. Thank you so much, Dan. Absolutely. And we're going to take just a minute uh, before I welcome the amazing Tatiana, uh, Chief Marketing Officer of Happy V, an e-commerce company. Uh, but I wanted to just do a quick introduction uh, to the series. Um, and uh, talk to you about some special gifts that we're gonna have for you guys. So this is the third of three of the Masterclass series uh, in partnership with Strive 305. Uh, our first session was on leveraging LinkedIn to grow your business. Our second session was how to conduct your own digital marketing audit. And today we're talking about tips to make Instagram pop for your brand. Um, I have an extremely exciting announcement about uh, a continuation of the masterclass series, but you're gonna have to stick around till the end to hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I will tip my hat to say that we are not ending here. Um, I wanted to obviously acknowledge uh, the mayor, Daniela Levine Cava's office and the Strive 305 initiative. Danilo here on his birthday, dedicated to helping small businesses in our community. My name is Dan Gretsch. I am a business storyteller all of my life. Uh, I have been building up to learn how to tell stories effectively, first as a journalist, then as a marketer, and now as a business owner and educator. I'm a proud graduate of an amazing program called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. I went to Princeton as an undergrad. I'm a panther, uh, where I got my master's degree in storytelling, and I was a Fulbright scholar in Argentina. And we've partnered, obviously, with the Office of the Mayor, but a lot of other top organizations, including the three major colleges in South Florida, uh, the SBDC, the Florida State Minority Supplier Development Council, to help you 
grow your business using digital marketing and to give you a simpler way to grow. That's what we're all about. As a thank you gifts for coming today, we're going to give you a handout with key takeaways from today's session on tips to make Instagram pop for your brand. We'll give you a link of a recording to today's webinar, and we are going to automatically register you for our upcoming masterclass sessions. We actually have a great session coming up next week where we're going to feature more than a dozen small business owners talking about digital marketing. So I hope you guys all come back next week for that. And then coming up in November, I'll tell you now, series two, uh, season two, I should say, of the Masterclass series. We're going to be talking about holiday marketing. We're going to be talking about lead generation tips and tricks. And we're going to be talking about the top trends in digital marketing for 2022 cannot be missed. All of you are automatically going to be registered and will be sent reminders about those as a thank you for coming today. We're also going to be having, uh, after today's session, uh, we're going to be sharing with you some information about our upcoming programs. Uh, and that does give you an opportunity to apply for a scholarship for women and minority-owned businesses and a free marketing consultation with me. At the end of today at 1.30, we're going to have a brief info session on our upcoming training programs, uh, the Digital Marketers Edge and the LinkedIn Business Edge. So if you're curious, what is it that BizHack does uh, besides giving great masterclasses, um, you're going to hear a little bit more about the Digital Marketers Edge program starting October 25th. Tati is one of the instructors in that program. Uh, we love to feature our certified instructors in our masterclasses. Before I introduce Tati, I wanted to take a quick minute and talk about safety on Instagram. <coughs> I'm the father of a preteen girl. <coughs> and any father, any parent uh, of a child who was seeing what came out in the news by the whistleblower about safety on Instagram has to be asking themselves, is it safe for my child to be on Instagram? It's a very personal decision. I think the the jury is out, honestly. I, I think that uh, Facebook has proven itself pretty despicable uh, and uh, I would even dare say immoral uh, in the way it's handled uh, safety issues for our children. And uh, I am frankly really disappointed and a little disgusted with some of what I learned over the past week. Now, I run a business that teaches businesses like yours how to use Instagram and Facebook as a tool to grow your business. And so how does my disappointment and my trepidation as a father translate to the business sphere? Is it still okay for us to be talking about how to make Instagram pop for your brand, given the bad actions that have been happening out of that company? And my answer to you is, that's up to you. Is your brand safe on Instagram is a, business, is a decision every business owner has to decide. And the way that I think about it is Instagram is a tool for growing your business. Instagram and Facebook reach 80% of the people online in the United States. There is no other social media platform with anywhere near that reach and ubiquity. Moreover, Instagram and Facebook, uh, especially uh, from the advertising perspective, are much less expensive than LinkedIn, Twitter, Google. All of them are more expensive. So Facebook is a great place to cut your teeth on digital marketing and digital advertising because it's cheap and because it's ubiquitous. Almost everybody in your our target audience could be reached there. And that's why we will continue to teach it as a tool for small business growth. But I do want to say that I'm marking a moment right now where we are having deep internal conversations about how viable is Facebook as a tool for business growth. And we haven't made a decision about it, but we are thinking about it. And I wanted to share with you where we are on this point because Part of what makes Instagram so unsafe for young girls is its focus on image. And today we're going to talk about how to basically do a great selfie for your brand, 
how to make your brand pop, look good on Facebook. And so I feel like I had to tell you that, you know, there have been some troubling news in the last week on this topic. And it does impact, I, I think, how you have to think about Instagram as a platform. So anyway, it's a little bit of a somber note, but I did feel compelled to talk about, you know, we are a missions, uh, we are a, a purpose and values driven organization. Um, and Facebook um, has really lost its way. Um, the whistleblower called them morally bankrupt, that they need to declare moral bankruptcy. Uh, and there are a lot of decisions that Facebook has made, not just about protecting preteen girls, that suggests that they have basically pursued growth at all costs. So uh, I am not a morally bankrupt person and I do not run a morally bankrupt company. And so I need to always be careful about which tools we use to help businesses grow. Tatiana McDaniel is our extraordinary, uh, I'm sorry, Lorena, I won't have time to call on you. Uh, you can feel free to put your comment in the chat though. Uh, Tatiana is the CMO Chief Marketing Officer of, Officer of Happy V, a women's wellness company. Uh, yes, that's what V stands for. Um, <laughs> she focuses on marketing uh, that educates and supports women. She's worked at some of the top agencies in the world, Young and Rubicam, Zimmerman, and, um, and uh, uh, oh my God. Uh, Havas. Hav Havas, thank you. It's th uh, some of the top five uh, marketing agencies in the world before going in-house to Happy V. She's also managed uh, at the highest levels some of the biggest brands uh, in a variety of industries. And now she's at using those amazing skills that she learned with multi-million dollar budgets to help a, a relatively young company, Happy V, blow up uh, online. And they're doing so well uh, that usually Tatiana would offer some free freebies to folks who participate in these masterclasses. Uh, and they have run out of stock. Uh, they, like many companies, uh, have more demand than they can fulfill. So Tati, that's all on you, baby. Congratulations <laughs> on your success as a marketer. Uh, I know that it's not uh, the ideal situation, uh, but it is um, you know, a, a testament to how the demand that you guys are generating in large part through your work on social media. Tatiana McDaniel. Thank you, Dan. Um, so let's get right into it. I appreciate the introduction, Dan. You're always so kind. Um, I'm excited for this. I'm excited to take you guys through some of the best practices on Instagram. And before I share my screen, I just want to say, you know, I've been a part of the BizHack team for, oh my gosh, since the inception. What was it? Seven, eight years ago, Dan? Um, so, so it's been quite a journey. There's been a lot of evolution, a lot of change, not only on Instagram, on Facebook and other social platforms. So what I will say is while we are specifically talking about how to make Insta how to make your brand pop for Instagram, a lot of these best practices that I'll take you through are cross channel uh, applicable. And so if you find that perhaps for your business, LinkedIn works better or Pinterest, or even now the really trending TikTok, a lot of what I'm going to share with you guys makes sense for those platforms too. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through everything in this presentation that it is a little bit interchangeable cross channel. And with that said, I am going to begin sharing my screen. Let me know. So today we're going to talk about tips to make Instagram pop for your brand. So getting right into it. Um, and I, do, I did see a lot of our ex-alumni and some current BizHack students on. So good to see you guys again. Um, Something really important that I wanted to kick off with is in the specific BizHack course, we focus the majority of our efforts on paid advertising. So what I'm going to talk to you guys today is more on the organic side. So this is the non-paid part of advertising or promoting your brand through Instagram. So we'll talk about the brand look and feel, the aesthetics. We'll talk about your brand voice. We'll go over how to create content calendars so that you're structured and so that you're organized with your content. We'll discuss a little bit about the difference between organic and paid, what we just talked about. 
Um, I'll give you some tips on Instagram stories, which also applies to Facebook stories, LinkedIn, et cetera. And we'll go through some best practices and some hacks and some tips that I'll give you. And then we'll close out with a little case study of something from my personal business, just so that you guys can see sort of some success, um, some su success stories. So getting right into the Instagram brand look and feel. Um, here are three different brands. Uh, I believe one might be a blogger, but nonetheless, these are three different Instagram accounts. And we can see very clearly through the visual elements selected, you've got Beautiful and Yummy seems to be more of a very chic kind of brand. Then we've got this brand in the middle, which is a little bit girlier. There's a lot of pink hues, a lot of lighter tones. And then you have this last brand, which is more fun. It's a little bit more tropical. But what we can see right off the bat when we go to these Instagram feeds is that there's consistency. You can identify and understand what brand these are coming for just by looking at their feed. And so what we want to do is we want to start creating these visual elements and identifying what those visual elements are for your brand that can make your brand be recognizable and consistent against all of the other brands that are also posting and also taking up feed space. This is just another representation of it. So as you can see, every third post in this first one is a quote. And what that does for the Instagram feed on their specific Instagram page is, is it creates this little center line of quotes with products on either side. Um, in the Cerebral Mist, they're alternating one quote, one image, one quote, one image. And so you kind of get that checkered box kind of look and feel. And then on the last one, what I wanted to point out was sort of color blocking and how by maintaining a focus on your product or your service with brighter colors, you can also draw your user's attention in. And it's not to say that one of these works better than the other, but what I, wanna, what I want to be taken away from this is from these examples is that there's consistency and the brand maintains a consistency. Now, you don't need to do this for the entirety of the existence of your brand, but there should be evolutions of these look and fields, whether that's seasonal or whether that's based on a product launch. Um, maybe you're announcing a new service that your brand offers. All of those can sort of bucket under these look and feels. All right. Now let's take a look at some of the bigger brands and who's doing it right. So I know this is kind of small, but we're all pretty much familiar. At least we all know who Coca-Cola is, that's for sure. Um, so it's no surprise that Coca-Cola does a great job at their ads um, and, and their news feed posts. But what you can see here is obviously they're leveraging their color red, um, but then they're sprinkling in some different colors as it makes sense for their whatever their campaign that they're running is. Uh, something that I liked about Warby Parker's is, and you can't really see it because I couldn't capture the entire feed, but they've added every so often pictures of dogs using or uh, wearing the glasses, which I think is just something kind of funny. It's lighthearted. Um, it goes well with the brand and with the brand voice, what the brand stands for. And so they do a really good job, again, of just keeping a consistent brand look and feel. Um, Many of you guys are probably familiar with Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, he is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to marketing, and he likes to talk about it a lot. And so something that I find really interesting in his post is it looks a little messy. It's not as organized and as neat and clean, let's say, as some of the other examples that I've shared with you. But what he does really great is he lets you know with the caption above the image, exactly what that post is gonna be about. So as you're digging through the feed, you can understand, for example, maybe one of these says, five tips for how to make your Instagram pop. And then you would wanna click into that because that label that he's added to the post is immediately eye-catching. And then there's no surprise that Nike does an incredible job. They don't really ever need to focus on their products. They have more of a lifestyle brand of people using the products that they sell. And so Nike is without a doubt, a no brainer in terms of getting it right when it comes to Instagram posts. So I know that we have a lot of small business owners here, small medium business owners, and that's really the focus. So I wanted to talk about some local brands that I thought were doing it right as well. 
This is Mandoline J and Bistro. It's a restaurant here in, in Miami and South Florida. And you can see they haven't really done much, but they have a very clean and simple Instagram. And why is that? They added simple border to every single image that they post. And just by adding that little simple white border, that stands out and that creates a different look and feel than if everything were just to be meshed together. And so there is some consistency in the lighting that they choose for their photography, but overall, very consistent. Now, looking at something more D to C, direct to consumer. So this is a product. It's uh, actually one of our former BizHack students, Wrapped Gift Wrap, and they create consistency through color themes. That's something that we do at Happy Bee as well. And in the next slide, you'll see the example for Happy Bee. But by creating maybe like a seasonal color palette, they're able to create a brand that's recognizable, create consistency, and almost like an evolution of their posts. Like I mentioned, another example of that is Happy V. So our handle is my happy V on Instagram, but we've done the same thing. So we decide what products we're gonna focus on, what colors are tied to those products. And then we make sure that there's a consistent flow and not everything is templated. And by templated, I mean, you know, selected uh, designs that then you populate with your content. Sometimes we'll grab images that we find that users post. And if the colors match up and if the design look and feel is aligned with our brand, then we use those for our posts. So now let's get into a little bit more of the specifics. So here we're gonna talk about aesthetics and font pairs. And this is just a sample of how we at Happy V uh, design our colors. So we have primary colors, and then we have secondary, tertiary, and even seasonal colors. Why is this important? So by maintaining a consistency with your colors, and this is not just on Instagram, this should be reflected on your website, on every social channel, on your emails, even a flyer that you send out. Everything needs to have consistency. So choosing the right brand colors is first. And it's not just saying, oh, we're gonna do pink, blue, purple, and green which pink, blue, purple, and green. And so getting as nitty gritty as understanding the Pantones or what you see here is the hex code. Those things are really important for you to keep in mind and consistent every time you do a post. So when you're using purple, you're always using purple hex number 798908 every time. And that way your brand has a consistent look and feel. Now, sometimes you may be launching a product or a service or it might be a season in which none of your brand colors fit. I mean, imagine if McDonald's only posted in red and yellow, like that would never, it would just be too much. So you can bake in other colors. If you want a seasonal color palette for the summer, you can add some brighter colors. If you want something a little bit more fall or winter, you can add more toned down muted colors. So all in all, what you should do is number one, provide quality content, but have that quality content, have consistent colors. And then if you can create templated posts, like I had mentioned before, so that you have a design and all you have to do is plug and play the image that you wanna showcase. And so this is an, an example that we've done. Every time that we're gonna do a video or an image, we have this design with a color, we've got our logo at the bottom, and then we just plop the image inside. And that helps us create a post really simple, really quickly and easy. And you only have to build out the templates once. So another design element that I wanna to talk to you guys about is font pairing. So choosing the right fonts. It's recommended that you don't use more than three different fonts for your brand just because you want to create the familiarity. So if they see a bunch of different fonts, then there's not really a consistency. So rule of thumb is you want a heavier font paired with a lighter font. And here are just some examples, Poppins and Questrial, and you guys can see the rest, but it's a really heavy, heavier font with then a lighter font pairing so that you can create headlines in the heavy font, subhead copy in the lighter font. Fontbear.co is a great website to just go in and explore, and they'll give you a lot of recommended font pairings, and that's really helpful for people who are just developing their brand. Um, and again, 
as always, it's not just Instagram. It's everywhere across your brand. These fonts should be consistent. Okay, now let's talk about one of my favorites, which actually isn't a visual thing. Um, it's the brand voice. It's how your brand sounds to the audience. So what is your communication style? And it can change depending on the topic, but your brand essence overall has to maintain some sort of a brand voice. And so when we talk about re recycling is the example that I like to give, you can, you can talk about recycling approachable. So you can say, join us on the beach. We're going to be doing a cleanup. Um, we're inviting everybody in the community to, to, do their, to, to do their part in recycling. That's a very inviting, welcoming brand voice. Or you could be very serious. Did you know that on average, we're wasting about 300 million tons of plastic every year? Something needs to happen. Our planet is hurting. A little bit more dramatic, right? We're still talking about recycling. And so, as you can see, the topic doesn't necessarily dictate the brand voice. The brand dictates the brand voice. So if you're a funny brand, if you're playful, if you're goofy, if you're sarcastic, if you're satirical, that's going to sound very different than if you're a chic, elegant type of brand. And not only does your visual element need to reflect that, so does your brand voice. So think about that as you're writing captions, as you're putting text overlay on your organic posts, and even on your paid ads. You want to make sure that you're being consistent with what your brand stands for. Other things that you can add on just to kind of give your brand a little bit more context, emojis, you can leverage trends, you can ask your audience questions that helps engage the audience, but maintaining always your communication style. Okay, so once we've defined all of the aesthetics, we know what our fonts are, we know what our colors are, we know what type of content we want to put out there. Now you need to build out your content calendar because you don't just want to throw something out onto Instagram improvised and see how it reacts and how the audience reacts. You want to make sure that you're planning ahead. And so this is an example of a calendar with four pillars. And what are the pillars? So in this case, we're talking about a food brand. They decided that they were going to focus on flavor, on health. They would post about trending topics and they would post third-party content. And when I talk about third-party content, I'm talking about things that other people have posted. So for example, user-generated content. Um, I think I saw Sandy in the group. Sandy sells soaps. So perhaps I buy one of Sandy's soaps. I love it so much. And I post a picture of it on my Instagram. Sandy can reach out to me as the brand owner and say, hey, Tati, I loved your post about the soap. Can I repost that onto my feed? Of course, I love Sandy. Sandy, of course, you can use my post whenever you want. And so now that's a third-party generated content that I'm going to, as the brand, promote on my channel. Same thing works with partnerships. If you're working with influencers, if you're working with other businesses and you guys do co-op marketing, that's what's considered third-party content. The important thing to take away here is you want to plan what your pillars are. What are my categories of communication? And then which one takes priority? What's the most important one? And that's the one that should fill up most of your calendar. Now, this example is not the best example because my recommendation for every brand, especially small businesses that are just getting out there, is you got to post every day. Every day there should be a post. So we're here, we see about eh, two thirds of the calendar, maybe 50% of the calendar is populated. You want your calendar to be full. Every single pillar, every single day, you're dividing that out into your 30 or 31 days out of the month and posting consistently every single day. So some of you may be asking, okay, well, how do I even build a calendar? This was built on a simple Excel, but there's lots of tools that can help you to plan, to prep your post. And these are just some examples. And in the handout that you'll be receiving at the end of this session, you'll see links and descriptions with pricing actually for each one of these platforms. But they all offer similarities and differences. Some are free, some are paid, some are paid depending on how many users you want. So depending on what your business needs are, I definitely recommend using one of these tools to do your content planning 
and to schedule your posts out. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about organic and paid and what the difference is between the two. So when you are running paid ads, you need a much more robust strategy than you do for organic posts. And those are the posts, again, that just go straight to your feed. Why? Because when you're running a paid ad, you have to define the objective based on what Facebook gives you as options for your objective. So what do I mean by that? On Facebook, you can decide, and I'm not going to get too much into this because it's a little technical, but there's a, something called the marketing funnel in which you bring people down this funnel to try to get them to convert at the bottom of the funnel. At the top of the funnel, you have awareness. Let me tell you that I even exist. And then you work your way down to the funnel to a final transaction, whether that be a purchase of a product, signing up for a course, you giving them your email as a consumer, whatever that final transaction is, that's at the bottom of the funnel. And so Facebook allows you to define what those objectives are in your paid ads. In your regular post, you don't. Your objective is to create engagement, to interact with your audience. Those are the objectives of organic posts. It's hardly ever salesy. It can be, it can be, but you don't have to physically go and select that and tell Facebook that's what you're trying to do. Another difference between paid and organic is with paid, you have much more specificity as to the audience that's seeing what you're putting out there. Who sees your organic post? The people who are following you. The people who are following you, and if you have a public page and you use the right kind of hashtags and maybe you geotag, you say, I'm here based out of Miami, maybe it'll have some spillover to people who aren't following. But for the most part, it's the people who follow you. That's who sees it. With paid ads, you can cast a much wider net and you can also be very specific as to who you want your audience to be. A great example of that, and if you don't know who your audience is, is to A-B test. So let's say you offer a service and you're not, let's say you teach a class, a course, it's an online course, and you're not sure if the West Coast audience is a better audience for you or the East Coast audience is a better audience for you. You can do with a paid ad, an A-B test that allows you to see what type of interaction I got with my West Coast audience, same ad, versus my East Coast audience. With organic posts, you don't have those kind of liberties. You just post once and whoever sees it, sees it. Of course, with paid ads, you have to manage budgets and you have to optimize your ads. With an organic post, when you post it, it's up. There's nothing you can do unless you want to take it down for whatever reason, but then it's removed from your feed and that's it. With ads, with paid ads, you can optimize them. You can see what people are commenting. You can go in and change it. You can pause it. You can add more funds behind it if it's performing better. So those are just some of the main differences between organic and paid and why it's important to have a paid strategy that goes alongside your organic strategy. Um, obvious things paid content are people who might not be fans of the brand just yet. And so you're getting your ads out in front of more people. That's really helpful. Um, the visual elements and the message does change a little. When you're doing a post, you're talking to your audience, people who already know about you. When you're doing a paid ad, you might be putting your ad for the first time in front of people that have never heard of you. So your copy and your content is going to be very different. Um, and then while it says that user generated content, we talked about this in the past, people that post like me, I would post the Sandy soap that used to not be really best practices to use as paid ads. We are seeing now that some brands are using user generated content for their paid ads. So that's just one of the, one of the differences here. And then here's a perfect example of the same exact post. One was post organically and got 54 likes, so no budget behind it. The other one was a paid ad with about just over $1,000 of a budget, and it got 13,000 plus likes. So you're talking, I don't know, six or seven cents per like, and it reached 47,000 people. So that's about, I think, two or three cents per reach, per person who was reached with this ad. So... 54 versus 13,000, 
but you had to do you had to have a hefty thousand dollar budget in order to reach that number but that just shows you the magnitude of what you can accomplish if you put dollars behind your ads okay now we're going to get into Instagram stories, which, like I said, applies for stories across all channels. The important thing to understand here is these are real time, for the most part, real time stories, not posts. So this is a perfect example. In the image that you're seeing to the right hand side, the circles at the top, those are the stories. The image beneath it, that's the post. So why are Instagram stories now so important? Because it's putting your brand front and center. When you open your Instagram, the stories have the, the best real estate. The stories are up at the top. They're before the fold or what's called ATF above the fold. And they're there static anytime that you're navigating through Facebook. So what's great is if you're constantly posting stories as a brand, you can skip um, you can skip the line and be at the front every single time. So it's important to have a plan and a cadence of how often you want to be posting your stories on a day-to-day -day basis so that, um, you can, so that you can promote your brand and get in front of that line. Something that's question, cool. Just two quick questions. Uh, uh, 20 minutes left, by the way, Dora Herrera right. asked, do you always request permission to repost? You should, it's best practices. It also starts helping to create community with your followers. And I'll get into that a little bit later. I, as a brand, always like to ask permission. You don't have to, and here's why. An organic post, since you don't have a budget behind it, doesn't need copywriting, it doesn't need um, uh, usage rights. So if somebody posts about your brand or a product and you wanna repost it legally, you have every right to. Now, if you're paying, then that there's a whole other issue and then you would need usage rights and all that stuff. But I think it's best practices to ask, especially because then you created a community, you created a conversation with that, with that follower. Perfect. And Danilo just said, uh, colors and typography evoke emotions, which fuels great branding. Awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. So true. Yeah. So one last quick thing, Dor Dora was asking, how do you decide how many ad dollars to invest? Uh, Dora, there's kind of a long answer and a short answer to this. The short answer is you have to determine what the value of a customer is to you, what's known as their customer lifetime value. And then once you've determined that, that will give you a much better sense of how much you can spend to acquire that customer. So uh, in marketing speak, we say that your customer acquisition cost has to always be less than your customer's lifetime value. Back to you, Tati. We have uh, another uh, 20 minutes or so. Awesome. Sounds good. So um, something to remember about stories. When you're posting Instagram stories, they disappear after 24 hours. So it's best practices to not overproduce your stories. They should feel a little bit more natural. Um, but if you are putting content out there that you want to stick around, that you want people to go back and reference, you can always highlight your stories. And I'm going to talk about that in a couple slides, but just keep that in mind. So how are stories different than posts? Like I said, the post is there forever. And these are, those are the squares that you're seeing here at the bottom. The stories disappear unless you highlight them. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is you have an opportunity with stories to get a little bit deeper into what you're trying to explain about your brand. So this is an opportunity to talk about functional benefits about your brand, your service, your products, emotional benefits. How does this make the user feel? And then finally, the post, imagine the post is sort of a snapshot of everything that you want to say. The story then peels back layers of that snapshot. So it's kind of like an onion, right? You have the post is the onion, and then the story is all of the different layers of that onion as they unfold and as you story tell. So we'll get into some tips for how to story tell. My number one tip, use more video. We're seeing video, I mean, and this, is, this isn't even news anymore. Video is well outperforming static post. And so in your stories, it's customary to see more video. 
Video also keeps the user engaged from swiping off your story and onto the next story. Because there's audio, because there's movement, that makes it more appealing for the, for the viewer. Also, have a plan for your publishing frequency. So if you're telling a story, make sure that you're telling the complete story and you're not leaving out any parts. And by planning that out a little bit, you can kind of give yourself tips of what you're going to do. So for example, if your brand is um, at a trade show event, you want to talk about your attendance at the show, your arrival, some of the things that you've seen throughout the show, and then end off with maybe some key takeaways or a sign off as you leave the trade show. And that's just one example, right? But everything that you post on your stories should go from beginning to end and it should come around full circle. You don't wanna leave the users guessing, oh, what happened next? Because what you wanna do is you wanna engage them. You wanna be, you want them to be waiting for your next post in your story, your next story post to know what happened next. So, that plus taking advantage of tons of Instagram features, and I'll show you those in the next slide, and then creating highlights with covers. So if you can see here, these are the highlights that I was mentioning, the circles here. And keep in mind what you're naming your highlights. Each highlight gets a name. It looks like this brand, Freedom Mom, named their highlights by their product name or by a category of care. Um, this one is actually Warmies, but since Warmies doesn't fit, it says instant war as the highlight. So I, I put that up there because you kind of got to keep in mind that some things may sound not right if they're not spelled out properly on your highlights. So all of those things are things to pay attention about. Um, oh, okay. So some tools that Instagram offers to engage your consumers, there's tons of them. There's polls, there's quizzes. You can add stickers and gifts to make your Instagram stories a little bit more fun and playful. Hashtags apply the same way they do to posts to Instagram stories. You can also tag people on your stories. If it's relevant, maybe you wanna tell them what time of day it is, or maybe you wanna let the audience know that it's really hot where you are and it's 82 degrees in Florida and it's you know 40 something degrees somewhere up north. So those tools that Facebook offers and that Instagram offers for the stories are really helpful. Again, small business is always a trending topic. And so if you want your brand to be seen within the small business place, you can always use hashtag small business. And then these are just visual examples of some of the tools that I just went through. Um, this one's a quiz. Not all of your content, by the way, needs to be directly related specifically to your brand. So it doesn't necessarily need to be branded in the stories like it does in the post, for example. So which goes better with this view, coffee or wine? Great. The user selects, that, that just creates engagement. How much do you love pizza for a pizza brand? What they would do is take this smiley and scroll it all the way to the end if they really love pizza. Another way to use the same scroll that we've done is what do you look most for when you're shopping for your supplement brands? Do you want same day shipping? Do you want good customer service? is pricing and savings what you're focusing on. And then the user would just move that down and select the one that they want. And that's a great way to use your Instagram tools to ask and, and create engagement from your customers on stories. And then this last one is another quiz. But as you can see, there's lots of options, right? Of what you can do with Instagram stories. So we've talked about posts, we've talked about the visuals, we've talked about your stories. Community management is so important Otherwise, don't post, don't do stories. And what do I mean by community management? Quick, quick, quick question. Um, uh, Charles Minifield said, should we have our posts already figured out before stories or should we develop a post based off the stories? So sort of post first, then stories, stories first, then posts. That's a great question. So your posting calendar, I recommend you plan out months in advance. So you're ideally wanting to plan out your calendars at least two to three months in advance. Why? Your posts, remember your posts are static. They don't go away. So you wanna capture photography. So maybe you're gonna do a photo shoot for those posts. You want to dig up and aggregate all of the user generated content that makes sense for your color scheme for that month. You need to plan that out. The stories are more real time. The stories require less planning than the posts do. Hope that answers the question. 
And then if you want to promote your post, you can always add your post to your story um, and, and give and build up off of that if, you, if it's relevant. So yeah, and the only, the only thing I would add is just if you're having success in a story, that's probably a good signal to you to turn it into a post. Sure. Uh, yeah. so, so stories are a little bit more of the moment. They expire. Uh, posts should be pre-planned um, and they inform each other. It's really yeah. not an either or, but it's a both end. This is a bit of a technical analytics question. Are we going to have an analytics discussion or... There uh, isn't an analytics discussion, okay. but I'm happy to take the question. All right. So Amy Palma, uh, one of our graduates, so she's asking kind of more advanced questions, said, how are stories counted in analytics? Do they count as a post? Do the likes count as engagement? Um, she needs this because her new job is to report KPIs and she wants to be able to report on the KPIs of stories. Sure. So the way that we report our the, the metrics that we gather from our stories is imagine that it's a different channel. So you track your posts metrics, you track your story metrics, and you're going to want to benchmark against your own in the beginning. There are some industry standards, but I always say best practices is you create your own benchmark as a brand and then measure yourself against that. And you're always wanting to make sure that you're increasing against that benchmark. Awesome. So tips for community management. So now you've got all of these great posts, you've got all of these great stories, people are commenting, they're interacting, they're asking questions. That does the brand no good if no one is responding. And so that's the element of community management. You wanna be sure that if there's a question, you're answering it. If there's a comment, you're answering it. So this brand Nutriful on their post, I know it's really tiny to see, but they have 64 comments on their post. Well, when I pulled that out and broke it out, it turns out they had 32 comments from followers and then 32 comments from Nutrafol responding to every single one of those comments for a total of 64 comments. What I mean by that is no comment should be left unresponded to. Even if it's not a question, if somebody says, wow, awesome job, you respond with, thanks, visit our website for more information, simple. And you can create automated responses to help you do that. But always, always, always respond to the comments. The other area of community management that I think a lot of people forget about is the brand has its own personality. The brand should be following other brands, should be following other Instagram accounts, and also commenting on those. And what that helps you do is it helps you get exposure on other people's pages. And so you want a community manager that's creating this ecosystem and these conversations, not only on their own page, but on other pages that are relevant to the brand as well. Um, moving right along. So here's an example of how by leveraging community management, we were able to turn commenters into super fans. So Callie and Alana, they're two of our Happy V super fans. I know they're tiny, but they've commented on a ton of our posts and they're always engaging with us. They're asking questions and we as the brand respond back to them. And we've created this, these sort of super fans just by adding the element of community management. And so one of them is a nurse, which is great for us. Once we start opening up our OBGYN element of our brand, we'll definitely reach out to her for some input. Another one is just a consumer of our product. And so we've even talked to her on the side about having her test pilots or test some of our pilot products because she's been using our brand for so long. She's somebody that we trust. She knows our brand. And so we'll send her products to try before we launch them. And there's so much value in creating these super fans because then they'll post on their page about you and they advocate for your brand. And that's ultimately what you want is to create this community. That's what social media is for. <laughs> so now getting into some hacks and best practices. This visual one is one of my biggest pet peeves and I see it all the time. We've got this vertical image, it looks great, but we need to create a square post. What do you do? You do not stretch out the image into a square and turn your bottle into this disc looking thing. You crop from the top, you crop from the bottom, and then you have a perfectly intact product with a square format. So crop images, don't stretch them. That's my number one. 
Also, you can use font weights instead of bolding them. We talked about font pairs. Just make sure that your fonts aren't kind of like competing with each other. Um, search on Google. If you're looking for images to post, Google allows you to search by image size. So that's a great option. And then frame your images. If you want to create a consistency, we looked at some of those examples, black frames, white frames, but that just helps sort of give your design a little edge. We talked about video outperforming images. The tip here is keep your videos short. People have a low attention span. It's decreasing month over month. So because there's so much content. So 10 seconds or less is my recommendation for videos. Um, and then if you want to tease out the video, if you do have a longer video, you can redirect your users to your website where maybe you have a 30 or 60 second video to watch. Um, this one is a common one. It used to be more common than it is now, but don't clog your captions with hashtags. Yes, hashtags help you get exposure, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a beautiful caption with then 75 hashtags in the same caption. You can add a comment with captions, that's okay, but try not to clog your actual caption. And now let's get into a quick example of a TikTok video that we launched that went viral. So I'm gonna give you the cliff notes and then we're gonna see if we have time to see this. But first of all, TikTok, we had no clue what we were doing. Um, and I'll give you, it'll come full circle to how this makes sense for Instagram. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we tried to put a video out there. This was earlier this year. It took us about five hours of scripting and editing and it was all organic. There was no paid behind this. Um, we even accidentally misspelled our brand name in the final video that went out there. But our video went viral. We had over half a million views and tons of comments, all of which we responded to. And the result was that we sold out of our product in 48 hours, both on Amazon and on our website. So I'm going to show you the video. Let's see. Um, hopefully it loads up. All right, it's kind of small, so I'm gonna try to make it a little bit bigger. I had BB for over five years. It's like, uh -oh. all right, let's see. Uh -oh. Okay. Not sure, not sure what's happening there, but I will go back. We can probably um, exit out of here. Ozzy, so take your time. Let's see if we can get it to work because it's such a beautiful example. I want to try to. Now, one thing right. you might want to do is stop sharing your screen. Um, and then when you reshare it, um, five years okay. share, I I share it for audio, back. and that might help. So when I you click share well, screen on the bottom left, every product for multiple infections, share, and nothing share was sound. Working. And optimize for video click, clip, okay. and that so might, I put upon that myself to do research. I, still, I had BB for over five years. All right, let's see if I can share this now. While you're doing it, someone asked about Reels. You know, TikTok is basically Reels. Uh, uh, Facebook copied TikTok, um, and so we're you're going to see essentially how Tati took a TikTok and then converted it to a very popular uh, piece of content on Instagram. Were you hearing the audio, Dan? Yeah, but it was kind of coming in a little awkward. So go for it. Okay, okay let's see. Years and switched my gynecologist five different times. All of them just kept prescribing antibiotics, not helping me get to the root cause. I tried every product for vaginal infections and nothing was working. So I took it upon myself to do research as to why nothing was solving my BV. And I discovered 22 million women suffer from BV each year in the United States. There had to be a solution that worked. So I turned to my partner who owns a dietary supplement manufacturing facility and we got to work. We created the first vertically integrated vaginal wellness company called Happy V that believes in science-backed ingredients, transparency, education, and helping women find relief. Since we launched in 2019, we've helped over thousands of women find relief. Follow us to learn more about vaginal wellness. Tati, would you mind playing the beginning again? Sure. I had BB for over five years and switched my gynecologist five different times. All of them just kept prescribing antibiotics, not helping me get to the root cause. I tried every product for vaginal infections and nothing was working. 
So I took it upon myself to do research as to why nothing was solving my BB. So beautiful example of business storytelling right there. And honestly, I mean, there's so many things that I can tell you were wrong with this video. Um, number one, our product was misspelled. Our, our brand was misspelled. The audio was not that great. The voiceover was, it could have been better. But ultimately, none of that mattered because the results showed that people enjoyed it and they liked it and they found it educational and trustworthy, so much so that we sold out of our product. And so what we decided to do was, oh, and here are just some clippings of some press coverage that we got, but TikTok made me buy it, um, was kind of like the headline. And then um, what we ended up doing with that video was we used that TikTok video as the ad for our Instagram stories uh, and Instagram posts. And so at the top of the funnel, from an awareness perspective, it's the video that has the lowest CPM cost per thousand impressions. And then at the bottom of the funnel, it's also the video that has the lowest CPP cost per purchase when it comes to conversions. And so I wanted to end on this note because you may be creating content on other platforms. And if it works on other platforms, like TikTok, for example, you can bring that into Instagram and leverage it for your organic post or for your ads and test it out and see if it works on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn just as well as it did on other channels. This example for us really did. And this is actually the screenshot of the misspelling of our brand. It's happy V, not happy Vu, <laughs> but it worked. And it, it, it has catapulted our brand. Um, we have since then had various videos go viral on TikTok. The algorithm for TikTok is very different than the algorithm for Instagram. But this was an organic post that we did on TikTok helped us go viral. So um, hope that that was an interesting way to end on this how to make your brand pop for Instagram. And any other questions? So um, we have uh, Jessica Welsh is asking, should you use copy your Instagram posts to Facebook or create unique posts? Great question. So you, you mean, should the same post be on Facebook and on Instagram? I think yes. that's what I got. That's the question. Yeah. So, so you have to, so my answer to that is you've got to understand where your audience is active and what your audience is looking for on each channel. Generally, the Facebook audience is a little bit of an older demographic. I'd say Instagram is, a, is somewhere in the middle. And then with the example that I just shared, TikTok, we've got a much younger demographic. So depending on what type of brand you are, what type of service or product you offer, that's how you would tailor the messaging. Um, if you're trying to cast a wide net, for example, I don't know, a household brand, Clorox. Clorox can do the same post on Facebook, on Instagram, something probably similar on TikTok. It might have more visual elements. But yes, you can do that across the board. Um, for my brand, for example, we offer dietary supplements for people of all ages. And so we promote our menopause products on Facebook. And then we promote our prenatal vitamins on Instagram. And then our menstrual pain relief products on TikTok. Because we know the audiences and we understand what type of content is being consumed by the different demographics on the different channels. Now, if you're a small business, you know, it's not a bad idea to post it on, say, a Facebook and LinkedIn. Those tend to pair nicely. Yep. Um, you know, Instagram is more visual. So I would sort of be thinking more of like your Instagram slash TikTok strategy. Yep. Um, you know, those are kind of a little more natural partner pairings. Um, you know, Twitter is um, kind of more of the moment. So like really good for sharing articles, but then you can go and share them on other places as well. You know, it depends really on uh, where your audiences are, but honestly, a sophisticated strategy takes each platform individually. Yes. The TikTok video went viral. How many times has it been seen to date? Uh, 650,000 times. Yeah. And we actually did a, a whole hour uh, basically breaking down that case study of when it went viral. Lilia, if you could, uh, if it's possible to add that link to the past BizHack Live, 
um, please do. Yeah. When you then converted it to an Instagram reel, was that an Instagram reel? Uh, it was, how, yeah, it was an Instagram video. Um, how much reach has it had and have you paid for any of it? Yeah. So that's a great question, Dan. So we did not, we, we posted it organically onto our page as a reel. That's right. But since it got so much traction, we're using that same video as an ad. And so we're using that to still incentivize sales. And so I'm not exactly sure what the conversion rate for that particular video is, but I do know that it has our, lo our lowest cost per purchase. And so people that view that ad in comparison to other ads that we have are converting at a much quicker rate, which is bringing down our cost per purchase. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, Tati, any, any final thoughts? This has been fabulous. We're going to um, wrap up briefly and then go right into an info session about one of our upcoming courses. Absolutely. No, well, I'll just say that if you guys have any questions, if you want to reach out to me, my contact information is in the handout sheet that you'll get at the end of this session. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And um, yeah, check out Happy V. Uh, our website is happyv.com and our Instagram handle is my happy V. We've been trying to reach this woman, Vanessa, who has happy V for the past two years and she won't answer our messages. So until then, <laughs> my happy V. I love it. So I just wanted to quickly share with you guys as thank you for being here today. A lot of you were asking, you will get a handout that Tati's prepared with the key takeaways. You'll get a link to this recording and you're going to automatically be registered for upcoming masterclass sessions, including next week's digital marketing celebration and case studies. So at this time next week, we're going to have 10 digital marketing case studies. About half of them We'll be talking about brand awareness through B2B thought leadership on LinkedIn. And the other half will be on lead generation through Facebook and Instagram advertising. We're also going to recognize a bunch of new biz hackers uh, who are going to be graduating from our two programs, giving out our highest award, the Biz Hacker Award. And we will be raffling off prizes and thank you gifts and uh, offering a musical surprise. Uh, so it's our graduation celebration and case studies in digital marketing. Honestly, it's my favorite public event that we do. Uh, it's also going to be uh, incredibly inspiring for those of you who are looking for examples, really concrete examples of how businesses uh, are using this. I also wanted to share formally that we are... Uh, due to the incredible response that we've gotten to this, we are going to be kicking off season two uh, next month uh, of the digital marketing masterclass series with Strive 305, starting with the holiday marketing roundtable led by the amazing Ricardo Barris, who you guys saw last week. Five lead generation strategies at work with our instructor, Alex Oliveira, and the top 10 digital marketing trends for 2022. We're going to bring Cheryl Cattell back to share those. Thank you, Danilo, for the opportunity to work with this amazing audience um, and to provide support to small businesses. And um, happy birthday, my friend. Thank you so much, Dan. Tatiana, great session. Thank you for everything you. you guys are doing. Thank you. So we're going to now go uh, straight into our session, uh, uh, which is about our upcoming uh, course that I'm one of the instructors of. So if you liked Tati and you liked kind of the feel uh, and the clarity and the sort of taking complex topics and making it simple, stick with us for a few minutes. We'd love to share with you uh, a little bit more about who we are and what we do uh, on the paid training side of things. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, Danilo, no need to stay around on your birthday. Thank you everybody uh, for coming today. So um, this is a brief presentation uh, that brings you kind of an inside view uh, of the Digital Marketer's Edge. This is the course that we've been teaching for seven years to more than 700 businesses. Uh, I first started teaching it at Miami-Dade College. And, and then four years ago when I started BizHack, this became kind of our signature core offering. It's a seven week program in lead generation for small businesses. How do you generate leads if you're a small business? I talked to you a little bit about myself and who we are. I talked to you about my mom and how I got inspired to help uh, the underdog from her. That's me and her uh, in our house in Philadelphia. 
Uh, I was a reporter for many years, and instead of covering uh, celebrities and politicians, I covered failing schools in the inner city uh, where my mom, the places that my mom used to teach. And, and I put failing, by the way, in parentheses. These were really successful places that were getting graded an F by the state. You know, today we're going to talk about a proven process for small business marketing that we call the lead building system. I hope that you can stick around and figure out whether our approach might be a fit for your business and your goals. And then I'm going to talk to you guys about our scholarship program for minority and women owned businesses. So for, for many of you, digital marketing is just really difficult. And I hope these last three sessions have shown you that BizHack can give you a simpler way to approach these challenging uh, issues. Questions of which channel to be on, who to hire, how to even measure success, where do you even start? This is Gartner, the top think tank in digital marketing, and this is an actual map of digital marketing. So it's not you. Digital marketing is really complex and there is no center. So what we've done is that we've created for small and medium-sized businesses a simpler and less intimidating way to figure this out. And we call it the lead building system. And the foundation uh, of the lead building system uh, is your business story. The six pillars are the six key elements you need to have in place for every campaign. The nine steps are the nine steps you need to take when launching a campaign for your business. And this is not for the faint of heart. It's not inexpensive. And it's really intense. And a lot of you, uh, you know, who are on this call right now are graduates of our program and can share that this is one of the hardest courses they've ever taken. But it's also one of the most transformational. We think of ourselves as that incredible physical trainer who pushes you to the brink to, push, to lift that heavy weight or to push you to the edge in that spin class because that's where the results happen. So we've created a systematic process and then we push you further faster than you ever thought you could go. We developed this methodology, drawing from the best ideas from the top digital marketers, IBM, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, LinkedIn, but then we've applied it to small business marketing, which frankly is a different ball game entirely, small budgets, limits in time and expertise. And one of our stars, is Raphael Savino of Ascendance Studios. He took our program uh, a few years ago. He's now being featured in national ad campaigns by Google and Facebook panels uh, as a digital marketing expert in his field uh, dance studios. It is possible within a few years, you can be recognized as one of the top experts in the field. The reason why, very few people know what the heck they're doing and everything is so brand new. So getting caught up is possible in seven weeks. And probably the single most um, proud metric we have in terms of measuring our success is the return on ad spend for our average participant in the program. So the folks who've gone through our seven week program uh, on average have generated $29 in new revenue for every $1 in ad spend within two months of completing the program. Now, lots of folks don't generate any revenue. More than half of them you know, aren't really set up to make money or they're still in the test and learn phase. Others will have 150, 200 uh, X returns on investment. And I'm gonna share with you guys a couple of examples uh, of businesses that have gone through the program that have seen either modest or really extraordinary success. And they're, they're, it, it is possible for you. Um, our next course uh, with Tatiana and our other amazing team members starts uh, on October 25th. Um, and the kinds of organizations that we work with are small, but we do want you to have what we call the biz hacker mentality, which means that you're growth oriented and you want to improve. And it, mean, and it means that you have a proven product market fit. Though we have had some startups come through us, what we specialize in is, you know, we've been selling this thing for 20 years. We know there's a market for it. We just can't figure out how to get them to buy us buy from us online, we don't know how to find them online, that's what we help with, is we want businesses that basically have really solid businesses that have been proven in the marketplace, but they're stuck when it comes to digital marketing because that Gartner map has overwhelmed them. And we also want you to be hungry, that you're more afraid of the status quo 
than change. You recognize that in this post-COVID world, in this digital world, you cannot keep doing what you're doing and still meet your goals. That your company might be shrinking or your company might not be growing fast enough and you need some way to market online, that's who we're looking for. That's who we uh, look for in the interviews that we do with potential candidates for our program. It's a admissions by application only. And then finally, just like Tati broke it down and kept it simple, digital marketing is re really complex. We start really simple and we build a ladder of complexity so that you can understand some of the most difficult concepts in digital marketing. And you come away seven weeks later and it's kind of amazing to see. You'll see exactly what we're talking about next week when you come to our digital marketing celebration. These are folks that two months ago, many of them had never marketed before. So I wanna share a couple case studies that talk about the kinds of transformational change that can happen when you educate yourself, when you invest in yourself, rather than trying to hire someone to solve marketing for you. Shakira Johnson is an incredibly talented PR person. She runs her own agency. Um, and her goal was to uh, launch a brand called Love by OMG. This is, uh, she wanted to use all of her skills as a promoter and PR person to actually help her build an e-commerce brand called Love by OMG and ultimately make money in her sleep. Well, Shakira had an incredible story. She got sick with COVID and nearly died. This was in the early stages of the pandemic. And uh, she was so sick that she uh, had to lock herself in her bedroom and communicate to her children through the door and they would, they would push the food underneath and her three kids and her husband lived in the living room in their one bedroom apartment. And she had a chance in this terrible time uh, of isolation and near death to ask herself, what do I care about and what matters to me? And what she realized is that she really wanted to move a little bit away from her PR and agency work and move towards a brand that she had created called Love by OMG. Now, this started out uh, as tea parties for girls and women. Uh, you can see there a picture of some of her neighbors at the tea party. So Love by OMG was really just an event that she used to host because she loved it. And then she realized, oh, you know what? There's an apparel brand in this. This is more than just a tea party. And for example, you can see here a piece of the apparel that they sell. Self-love is the best love. And she just wanted that message out in the world. And she wanted to create a passive income while getting that message out there. So. The problem is that she had no idea how to drive traffic to her e-commerce site. And she decided to use our program, which taught her how to advertise. She spent very small money in test and learn budgets. Uh, she, based on our recommendations, updated her website, doubled web traffic to her website, and was able to actually close one purchase while in the program. Now, she spent a grand total of 30 bucks advertising. She generated 14,000 eyeballs, 10,000 individual people, 232 of them watched her video that she was advertising, 100 of them made it to the website, which is a great conversion rate, and one of them made a purchase worth $23.80. So you might say that was a losing campaign, and I would agree with you. Yes, she spent more money on the ad than she did on the sale, and that doesn't even take into account the making of the shirt and the shipping. So should she give up? No, no, this is just the start, right? What an amazing accomplishment that with a $30 ad budget, she was able to prove that yes, people will buy this, strangers will buy this. So that just got her going. And now she has a thriving e-commerce brand where of course the return is much better than one sale for every $30. And she told us, and she was named the Biz Hacker Award winner for her cohort. She coined the phrase, never say die. And now we call that never say die, can do attitude is core to Biz Hack and who we are and who we're looking for. If you're a never say dyer like Shakira, then we want you. Let me give you another example of our most dramatic return on investment in the history, return on ad spend in the history of Biz Hack. And you're gonna be really surprised when you see the details of this one. Antoinette Patterson 
runs One World Learning Center. It's a child care center. Uh, and she also had a summer reading and literacy camp. It's in inner city Miami uh, in the Alapata neighborhood. And she primarily services moms and dads, families in that immediate vicinity. What makes her extraordinary is because most of those folks are low income, her learning center is free. She can help them get federal aid to qualify them for free childcare and free education. It's just a matter of them knowing that that's available to them. So how, why did she start this program? Well, she uh, had put her own son in a local child care center and due to lax safety, her son was injured permanently. And she said, I will never let that happen to any other child again. And so she started One World Learning Center and her goal in the first 15 years of running this business was to have a wait list and she had never achieved it. She just couldn't get enough moms interested to get that wait list that she had dreamed of her whole life. Well, she turned to us, she turned to BizHack and she turned to a ad budget of only $15 a week, uh, $15 a day. Now, her ad was the ugliest ad I've literally ever seen. It was a, this is a screenshot of the video she made. The first image was of a sign, her front sign, and it was red text. All right. Like this violates everything that Tatiana just taught us about how to make your brand pop, how to look good. But <laughs> the one thing that she did that was really good is she really nailed her targeting. So um, I said she was in Alapata, I meant Opalaka. She said, let's look for people in the Opalaka neighborhood, plus 10 miles, who are 18 to 55. Most of her customers are women. So let's just focus on women. And then they have one of these interests that pretty much signal they either have a school-aged child or they're really interested in the education of children. So that was her mar targeting criteria. And... She spent 200 bucks while running the ad in her program, reached 5,000 people. You can see, by the way, that because her target audience was very specific, um, whereas in the other example, um, $30 reached more than uh, 1,000 people. In this case, 200 bucks reached only 500. So depending on which eyeballs you're targeting, the ad budget goes up. That was a question that had come up. So she spent 200 bucks, generated 31 leads, uh, while in the program. And so that's a cost per lead of $6.55. Uh, not bad, right? Well, now look at how much money she makes when she um, actually turns these people uh, into students. So the lifetime value of an infant entering her program is $30,000. All this is subsidized by the federal government because they tend to stick with her for three years. It costs about $15,000 for her to service them. So her net profit or lifetime value for an infant coming into her program is $15. Remember that lead costs $6.55. If they're a little bit older, if they're a two-year-old and they stay in her program for an average of two years, her revenue is $11,400. And so this is what she made on this campaign. She got spent $200 to generate leads. She ended up closing five of them and she made $64,000 in lifetime value on a $200 ad spend. That's a, for anyone keeping track at home, that's $317 in revenue for every $1 in ads. So it, that is an extraordinary result that is not common. It's also kind of lucky. Uh, she had an incredible offer and she had, even though she had a really weak visual, she had really good targeting. So um, that doesn't happen for everybody, but it is a real case study. Another example is uh, Cristobal Giddy of Machido Karate, Miami. Uh, he was part of a program we did with the village of Pinecrest. He really didn't have a good grasp on his business story. And so we really taught him how to articulate the fact that his father who came here as an immigrant from Chile as an architect, uh, who died young, who gave him the business to run and grow was what led him to want to grow this business. It took him from one path to a completely different one. We call that his story of me. So, so we work with you on really identifying your business story uh, and articulating that in a compelling way. And as a result, 
uh, Cristobal has had a better time retaining his clients uh, and bringing new ones despite COVID. And then finally, more than half of the folks who go through our program are actually B2B companies, business to business companies. I know so far the examples have been uh, B2C or consumer. So here's an example of a marketing agency that sells to other businesses. Uh, Joel Levy of ScreenCo, he ran a quiz for his ad campaign. It was in Spanish because he targets Spanish speaking uh, countries. And uh, in order to see the results of your quiz, you had to enter your email. This is what's known as a free irresistible offer. It's basically a lead magnet. And um, in this case, they were trying to sell watches. And so they invited people to say, which smartwatch is best for you? And that's the sort of thing that their ideal customer, someone who's shopping for a smartwatch, would definitely take. And then they get their email address uh, as a result. Uh, they spent $54 on this. They had 170 people complete the quiz. 100 of them put in their email address. That is an extraordinary cost per lead of $54. That was very uh, exciting to their customer. And they, it was such a successful campaign that they then sold that tactic to two other clients who had a $1.22 cost per lead and a 31 cent cost per lead. So if you're an agency, you can develop tactics for one client and then sell them to others. That led to a uh, ability for them to both make $1,367 in additional uh, agency fees and get a nearly 2x return on investment for their clients. Now, Joel, as you can imagine, ran an agency. So he came in really advanced. And some people ask me, you know, I'm really at the beginning. Uh, I've never done marketing before, or I really know a lot. Can this course help me? And what we have found is that if you come in with a relatively uh, low knowledge, um, you can go from uh, very low knowledge to a seven. Seven is considered basic mastery. If you're like Joel, you come in with already having basic mastery, his learning uh, and understanding still jumped uh, to expert level. And we actually measure these results in a test, a uh, concrete knowledge test, and you can see the kind of results that we got. Uh, Lilia, you said there was a question? No. Okay. So um, our goal here is breakthrough results. We're really trying to get you to have um, kind of a before and an after uh, biz hack. Uh, Yoel Gutierrez runs a mosquito uh, uh, pest control company. He was able to spend $1,000 during the course and generate $30,000 in, in revenue. Uh, I'll be honest, Yoel has taken these learnings and just run with them. He's now one of our top instructors, and uh, he's teaching other Mosquito Joe franchises uh, from around the country how to market themselves, and he's in huge demand. Um, in fact, he's so popular uh, that his business partner, that's Omar right there, uh, he, uh, Omar is now taking the course as well, so he can learn uh, and take over some of the marketing from UL. Neto Almanza uh, runs a school, the San, San Jorge School in Mexico. Um, he was be able to triple enrollment, and I know this kind of is a crazy number, but by tripling enrollment over the eight-year average enrollment of these little kids, he increased revenue for his family's school by $1.39 million uh, on an ad spend that didn't even break $1,000. So uh, just really life-changing uh, impact on this, on this school. We also had one of our favorites is Otero Dental Center, the amazing Angie Otero and her dad. Um, Angie was a very sophisticated marketer when she came in. She already had a master's degree in FAU and in integrated marketing, but they did not teach her how to run a campaign on Facebook using automation. And so she built uh, a messenger bot campaign, spent a little bit under $3,000 on it, generated uh, 113 first visits and 150,000 uh, new patient revenue. This was so transformative that they, they've since purchased two more locations uh, and are very close uh, to being able to actually sell their dental center chain uh, to uh, and, and basically retire uh, before she turns 30. So how do we do this? How do we get these results? We talked about the lead building system. The foundation is your why. We then have the six pillars, objective, audience, offer, video, message, and call to action. And then finally, the nine step process that we walk you through that. 
Our teaching philosophy is learn by doing. So while you run the campaign, you're running, while you take the course, you're running a real life campaign and you're uh, getting uh, incredible lessons, not only from experts, but also from your peers. And we also just care a lot. So the science of learning for adults is learn by doing. And the heart uh, is we are a heart driven organization with very deep values about helping small businesses. And we will go out of our way to help get you breakthrough results. The way we do that is through great content like you've been seeing, personalized coaching and an amazing community of other business owners trying to do the same difficult thing. And our methodology is storytelling strategy and the cutting edge tools software uh, like Facebook ads, LinkedIn, uh, to help you achieve your goals. And um, we, we touch on a lot of topics. It's definitely a fast moving course, but the real heart of it is real people, real ads are targeting real people with one-on-one -on -one help from experts and support from your peers. Next week, you're gonna see uh, more than uh, three dozen businesses receive a certificate of completion like this one from Shakira. So it's an industry certification. The course is taught uh, Mondays um, uh, twice a week for two hours. Uh, everything is recorded for later viewing. We also had labs and one-on-ones and we do offer a money back guarantee. If you don't, if you go through the program, complete all the work and don't feel you got your money's work, we will give you your money back. We know uh, your money is precious and we want to be honorable about it. So we do offer a scholarship program for entrepreneurs of color, women-owned businesses, and nonprofits. Um, we've given out more than $90,000 in scholarships. The scholarships are a $500 uh, discount uh, scholarship off the course, which brings the course fee to $3,000, and we have payment plans available. So the next step is for you to reach out to us uh, and let us know um, if you'd like to schedule one-on-one -on -one with me. Uh, you can also, uh, uh, you'll get an email, which will allow you to schedule time with me. Uh, and we're also happy for you to just say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We're happy just going to your free master classes. So thank you guys for sticking around. Really appreciate it. Um, I see a question from Stephanie. Uh, are these programs tax deductible? Yes, they are. Um, we have a, uh, you know, training is a tax deductible expense. Um, and so uh, it is a way for you to, to write off the expense. All right. Thank you to, uh, uh, to uh, Tatiana and to Danilo. Uh, we'll see you next week at the celebration of digital marketing case studies. Uh, I'm Dan Gretsch. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.